Dear Lord, thank you for um, dying on the cross for us and help us remember that and be thankful for that and um, take this in a way that um, that shows our thankfulness and gratitude for what you did. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear Lord, help us to be thankful for all the pain and suffering that you went through for clearing us of our sins and um, help us to cherish coming together and worshiping you and being with one another. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, New Year's resolutions are not exactly a Christian exercise per se, <laughs> but changing for the better certainly is. Uh, we call it <coughs> repentance. Repentance is much more than being sorry for something that you've done. It means to stop doing things that we know are wrong and start living another way. In fact, uh, here's a good way to remind yourself what repentance is. Um, what do these letters stand for? Uh, say them together. The P is for heart. Uh, the N is for neutral. <laughs> the D is for drive. The L, low. Okay, drive low. And the R is for? No, repent. The R is for repent. Uh, it's to stop going one way and start going another way. Well, week before last, uh, we looked at what is usually called the parable of the sower, as we saw that it's really not about the sower or the seeds, but about the soils that the seed fell on uh, when the sower tossed it out. Okay, well, what Jesus was saying is that we are dirt. Okay, if it makes you feel any better, we're soil, okay? Uh, but it was all about the reality that when it comes to productive growth, no matter how good the seed or the sower might be, the primary factor that determines whether there is produce at harvest time is the soil. Of course, Jesus was talking about his teaching as the seed and our hearts as the soil. So we ended with the question, uh, what in my life is prohibiting or impeding growth? In other words, what is keeping me from becoming more like Jesus? And the goal, of course, is to let the seed take hold and produce a crop. Sometimes I need to leave a series, you know, at New Year's because everyone is thinking about change, but it so happens that this is a perfect lesson for this transition, isn't it? So we can remember that Jesus identifies three conditions of the heart. I didn't identify these, but we saw them in Jesus telling of the parable and the explanation. Three conditions of the heart which can prohibit fruitful growth. And we'll look at two of those today. But the first is hardness. So let's reread Mark uh, chapter 4, just verse 4. To begin, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Now, while they were with the crowd, Jesus' inner circle of, of followers probably, you know, did what we often do uh, when we think that we're supposed to understand something, you know. Um, you know, they probably nodded along and maybe even said amen when it seemed like he was making a point, but they didn't really get it. You know, they're just playing along. And so when they're alone after this parable, Jesus' disciples asked him what it meant. Really, they asked him what the parables were all about, but uh, he knows that they're not understanding this particular parable, and he actually seemed a little perturbed that they didn't get it without remedial help. But he does go ahead and give them uh, the explanation on down in verse 15. So Jesus said, what it means is that some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown, but as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. 
That's the hard, impenetrable soil. It doesn't get down into the soil. So if hardness of the heart is a pervasive condition, uh, that means it's completely hardened, then no growth will be able to occur at all. Pervasive hardening allows no growth. The seed cannot even penetrate. Jesus indicates that this person is fully under the influence of Satan. Now they probably don't call themselves Satanists. They probably aren't praying to Satan. They aren't asking Satan what to do. Uh, they're not even consciously choosing Satan's guidance. They just uh, subconsciously let him determine what gets into their heart. As soon as they hear the word, Jesus says, Satan comes and takes it away. It's not the result of demonic possession. It's the result of the person's own hardness. Uh, God has given us the freedom of choice. And what we will not allow God to control comes under the control of Satan. There are only those two options. So you probably wouldn't be here today if you had a pervasive hardness of the heart. Uh, you wouldn't be willingly uh, you know, exposing yourself to the Word, to Jesus' teachings. Uh, but most of us, unfortunately, do have a selective hardness of the heart. Uh, it's not pervasive, but it is invasive. Uh, selective hardening of the heart uh, invades our heart. Uh, there are different arenas in which your heart could be hard. Uh, you may have a hard heart when it comes to religious teachings, you know, religious practices. Maybe your heart is not open to learning anything new when it comes to religious teachings or practices. You think you've got it all figured out. Uh, a friend of mine told me about an elder in his church. Uh, he was a, a youth minister at the time who had a license plate frame that said, happiness is being right. And he thought he had everything figured out. He was right about everything. Well, many in Jesus' day were like him. They were not willing to let Jesus' emphasis on the internals as opposed to the externals penetrate into their hearts. They had studied the law of Moses, the Levitical teachings about religious practices until they were comfortable with what was true and correct. They knew who was right and wrong. They knew how everything was to be done in the temple. Uh, they weren't about to listen to this young upstart from Galilee, of all places, uh, let, and let him tell them that God never really cared about all of that unless it was used to help them love God and love each other. See, they knew the letter of the law, but not the Spirit. So when Jesus began to expose their lack of insight, uh, it wasn't long before they began trying to kill him. And in Mark's story, they've already begun that process. Their hearts were too hard to even think about anything different from what they had always thought. But there are other ways that we, our hearts can be hard. Our hearts can be so hard when it comes to some religious external that we will let Satan control our actions and attitudes rather than Jesus. But we also may have a hard heart when it comes to some moral or social issue. You know, maybe you're not willing to change your understanding. Or maybe God is trying to help you be free from some addiction. And maybe you cannot believe that change is really possible for you so you won't let the seed penetrate and, and change you. Maybe it's the idea of forgiving someone who has really hurt you. You know, maybe you can't believe that people really can change you that all the time. People don't change. Uh, maybe not even you. You know? Well, I'm not suggesting that our hearts are hard and controlled by Satan just because it's hard for us to open our hearts or because we try and fail over and over again. But we can call this ongoing struggle selective hardness of heart. And it can be very dangerous. Uh, but not fatal until we let it get worse. In fact, as long as we remain humble, our struggles are what keep us close to God. 
because we know how much we need Him to work in those struggles. So just be aware, though, that selective hardness of the heart can grow like a cancer and become pervasive. It can take over your heart. Hardness of heart uh, has become pervasive if there's anything that Jesus teaches by words or example that we refuse to even try to be open to follow. You know, it, it's maybe even when we're willing to follow Jesus anywhere but there. You know, maybe in most aspects of our life, yeah, I, I, I get him there, but that's not a place I'm willing to go. Well, if I reserve any part of my heart and refuse to leave it open to God's rulership, then that hardness can spread throughout the heart until the seed is just forced right back up out of the ground. You know, we need to just stand back, take a deep breath, and ask ourselves what we're so afraid of. If there's something like that in our life. Would God ask anything of us that won't be far better than what we would choose on our own? So hard hearts will not allow God's word to penetrate and grow. But Jesus continues to say that even rocky hearts are a problem. Rocky hearts will not sustain growth. Uh, have you ever transplanted a large tree? Um, we needed a tree in our yard in Valencia. We moved into this little place that had been a rental. We eventually bought the house, but we were working on it even while it was a rent. We were good renters. <laughs> But uh, there was this oleander tree on some abandoned property, and it, it looked small enough to me that I could probably lift it onto a truck. And so we had some friends, uh, Larry and Dee Pope, that uh, had this big truck. They couldn't even quite fit it into their garage, you know, unless they pulled it all the way in. You know, the garage door sort of leaned out when they, when they let it down. And so, you know, I thought, you know, you know that, that truck's certainly big enough to move the tree and so I got the truck and I, I dug all around it. it. Took me a long time to dig around. It was bigger than I thought it was but I, I persevered and uh, got it all ready and so then I went and got Larry to help. I couldn't lift it in the truck. So I went and got Larry to try to help me to lift it in the truck even though he had a bad back. Uh, <laughs> and we couldn't get it into the truck. So two days later we finally returned with two more people and we finally got it onto the truck and got it to our house into the hole that was waiting at my house. And I got it up and I reinforced it with guy wires. I put mulch in and around the hole. A neighbor brought over some vitamin B12, which was supposed to help the roots recover from the shock of being transplanted. And so I poked holes around the base of the tree. The vitamins and water you know, needed to get down to the roots and it was looking pretty good. Uh, the leaves were a little withered, but they looked like uh, you know, they'd recovered. Uh, well, I, I heard, had heard a gardener say that you should prune off the same percentage of foliage from the top of the plant as you lost from the roots. You know, you can, had, had to guess how much you might have lost, but it didn't look like I'd lost a lot, and so I trimmed a little from the top, you know. But I wanted to leave, you know, a lot of leaves, so I didn't trim all that much. Well, maybe you can guess what happened. Uh, within a few months, maybe not even that long, the tree looked dead. Uh, and so I thought, well, it didn't get hurt anything. In a last ditch effort to save it, I cut everything off of the top. <laughs> okay. And it looked like that mulberry tree is going to look before long. Um, well, to the surprise of everyone in the neighborhood, uh, it actually came back. And after it recovered, I actually had to every year, several times, trim off, trim off bins full of branches, uh, you know, just because it was so prolific. But what had happened? Well, look at, at verses 5 and 6 of Jesus' uh, parable first. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the, soil, uh, when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. The problem with my tree was it was all about the roots. The tree that I planted turned out not to have an adequate root system to support the vegetation above ground. When I finally cut all of that away, then the roots had a chance to rest and grow so that they could start all over again. And then the vegetation at the top was soon twice what it was when we moved it, 
and it never quit producing more and more. And we noticed we've been back in Valencia and they got that, rid of that tree altogether because it was actually <laughs> encroaching on the house. Well, with plants, uh, what is beneath the surface is more important than what is visible. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Without a strong, healthy root system, plants will not live for, for long. Now, let's look at Jesus' explanation to his disciples in verses 16 and 17 of this phenomenon. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. <coughs> so, um, it turns out that people are not so different from plants. Some of you have probably even been accused of being vegetables. Uh, I once got a couch potato pillow but it was because I worked so hard, so this, this is her excuse, uh, and I needed to, to veg out. But Jesus is actually comparing all of us to vegetables in the sense that we need a strong system of roots beneath the surface. If we have weak roots, our plant parts above the ground will not live long enough to bear any fruit. We've heard the message of the parable repeated by Paul, by James, by the writer of the Hebrews as we looked at Perseverance. It's all about perseverance. It's about remaining faithful, being patient, never giving up. It's one thing to believe, but another to have faith. It's one thing to want to be rescued, but another, you know, you're going to grab onto the rope that the rescuer lets down to you, but then it's another thing to hang on to the rope until you're safe. That's the perseverance. So you might hear the good news about God's love for you. That's great. About how Jesus let go of equality with God to come and rescue at the cost of his own life. And you might respond with oohs and ahs. You might jump at the opportunity to be baptized even in Jesus' name and call yourself a Christian. You might become the most enthusiastic member of a church family. You might dive into the lifestyle that is characterized by gratitude and joy, resulting in living to serve others rather than yourself. You might do more and be a more effective servant than anyone else until something happens. You know, maybe your husband doesn't share your faith, so he begins to resent God and forces you to make a choice. You know, or maybe a young person is dating someone and your girlfriend wants to party as the world parties. You know, uh, you have to make a choice. Maybe the persecution comes from within the church family or the Christian community. You know, something really bad happens or you're mistreated uh, by your church family. Maybe you work in some job where you're forced to choose whether to lower your standard, standards or lose your job. Um, I don't know whether you remember Knott's Landing. It was a spinoff of, of Dallas. And one of our members in Santa Clarita I've told about before was Lar Park Lincoln. Lincoln was her husband's name, and I guess Park was, must have been her maiden name, and I never asked her about that. But uh, she played a not-so-nice character in that series. She was the young woman who had affairs with all of, the, all of the women's husbands. But Lar had a pretty good career going. Uh, she was even the sole surviving girl in one of the early Friday the 13th movies. There's always just one survivor in those. She was the survivor. You know, so that's pretty, pretty big stuff. But she started turning down roles when she had her kids. Uh, she was offered all these roles that began to be, you know, the kind of character that she played in Knott's Landing. Uh, she said she got tired of her wardrobe being a bed sheet. And she had two little kids. She, she just made a choice. She wasn't proud of some of the choices that were made up to that time. But her heart was not so rocky as to squeeze God out. In fact, she let God squeeze her career out. And after that, the only career she had was on the shopping channels. <laughs> uh, so how are we sustained through trouble and persecution? 
Well, another woman whose husband was the most admired and beloved deacon in the church, a good father, a doctor who shattered her life, the lives of their four children, when he had an affair with the young wife of one of his best friends, who was also, they were both members of the church. She worked for him. Um, this woman, the wife, s suffered severe emotional struggles. Uh, she had to learn to live on little or no money because his income eventually was gone. He lost his license to practice. She watched helplessly as two of her children fell into drug and alcohol use, and yet she never blamed God. She never quit going to church. She never quit believing. She went back to school, got a law degree, made at least one move specifically to get her children into a church family where they'd have some opportunity to recover and rebuild their own faith. Well, what made the difference between her and another bright young preacher's wife who was married to a hardworking young preacher with a heart of gold? Uh, he wasn't necessarily the most talented guy around. He didn't have that much formal training, but he was very dedicated to his work and to that wife and to their two children. But it was a small church uh, in a small town. Uh, growth was slow at best. They weren't very well paid for their efforts. Some of their members were critical of him and, and of his work. Uh, they didn't agree with some of his views. So I don't know why, but that might have been a part of why she looked at other places for fulfillment. You know, it wasn't all uh, what it should have been in the church family. But in any case, she got a lead role in a play in a community theater, and she ended up falling in love with the leading man and ended up leaving her husband and children. Well, what made the difference between the reactions of these two women who faced persecution of a sort? Well, I'm sure there are many factors that no one can understand, but one thing is clear. One had let the roots of her faith grow so deeply into her heart that all of that intense persecution could not destroy the plant. She hung on more tightly uh, to the church actually to us, their family kind of became a part of our family. The other had not let the roots grow very deep. Her plant that you could see above ground seemed vibrant and fruitful. She was a good preacher's wife, you know. Uh, but some persecution, whether large or small, revealed that her root system could not sustain her through hard times. So how can we know that we are ready for the hard times? Well, that's easy. Uh, let the word grow in your heart. <laughs> Fertilize it, water it, prune off you know, some of the branches, all of the branches maybe. And you're saying, all right, thanks for a lot of the preacherly advice. That's really, really gonna help. Well, I'll tell you, here's, here's something more. You don't really need anything more than letting the seed really grow. In fact, there is nothing more, but maybe I can say it in a way that will help us a little bit more. Uh, listen again, let the word grow in your heart. You mean the Bible? Let the Bible grow in my heart? No. Finish this, in the beginning was the word. The Bible is the word of God in a sense, but the Bible is not the word. The Bible communicates the word. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the whole truth. Now, Jesus was not addressing that particular confusion, the confusion of the Bible, you know, versus him being the word, because when he told this parable, the terminology wasn't around yet. Uh, neither he nor the Bible was actually called the word at that time. But if you had asked the religious teachers of Jesus' day how to build a strong faith, they would have said, study the Torah. The Torah was Moses' law, which God had handed to Moses personally on Mount Sinai. Now that has to be reliable, right? Uh, it was, but not as a source of faith. It was reliable as a source of truth. Faith is something that grows under the surface, within a person. 
The seed of faith is the word itself, not the facts about the word. You have to know the facts, but knowing the facts is not enough. You have to act upon your knowledge of the facts, but actions are not enough either. You have to let Jesus into your heart. That means that you have to know him and you have to think and feel as he felt. Uh, we can make everything so complicated sometimes, uh, but this isn't one of those things. Some things are complicated. Some things are hard to understand. Some things are hard to comprehend, though. And that's what this is. No one will ever fully comprehend the love of Jesus, but anyone can know him. A child has no comprehension of his parents' love, but children know their parents. Uh, if you believe that you are saved because you did all the right things and you believe all the right things and you're part of a church that does everything in the right way, your faith is in facts. When a question arises and maybe it upsets you, how do you react? Maybe somebody makes you a little uncomfortable when you tell them about your beliefs. That happens to me a lot. Well, should I immediately jump into correcting all of the facts that they may seem to have wrong? You know, the terminology, the, the ideas about practices, maybe even the ideas about God. Uh, well, they may need to know some facts, and it may be my duty to help them discover those, but where do I begin? If I don't center everything on Jesus, the Word, then I will stun their growth. When a controversy or some other trouble or persecution comes, will it help them to know the facts? Well, yes, it will be helpful if, but only if, they come to know Jesus. And of course, that starts with us. We have to let Him grow in our hearts. We must let the seed take hold and produce a crop. We become Jesus in this world. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful that Jesus came and he spoke the word, but even more than that, we're so thankful that he lived the word. He lived the truth out in his life. He showed us what you are really all about, that you're not just about fear, you're not just about punishment, you're not just about uh, punishing sin, but you're about loving us and showing us what is wrong because you love us. And that's the only thing that allows you to uh, punish your children, just like we have a hard time punishing our children, but we know that we must do it to, out of love. And we're thankful that Jesus uh, settled that once and for all uh, by showing us all aspects of your character we're thankful that we uh, get to do the same thing for others, that we can show others that you're all about love and not just about punishment and sin and jealousy. We pray these things in Jesus' name.